to this webinar of FEPS, the Foundation for European Progressive Studies on Social Investment. Mm -hmm. um, this is a webinar um, which is based on Zoom, but also we have an audience on Facebook Live. I'm informed that there are some issues with Facebook Live, but hopefully this will go away uh, very quickly. We believe um, putting social investment into the focus of the discussion. Can you still hear me, guys? Before May Day is um, absolutely timely. And we will have a special panel uh, today to discuss uh, this topic. Yeah, we do you hear do you hear the Zoom uh, thing because it's uh, because it's uh, it's going on and uh, Okay, good. Mia highlights first and we will have with us um, uh, Nicola Schmidt, uh, the Commissioner for Jobs and Social Rights, a uh, member of the European Commission, former minister from Luxembourg. And we will also um, have uh, um, further uh, discussions of this topic, starting with Irene Tinagli, who is a member of the European Parliament, the SND Group, and chair of the Econ Committee. Uh, but the topic will be introduced by Professor Anton Heimreich uh, from the European University Institute, who is an author of a study recently commissioned by FEPS uh, um, titled Social Investment Now, Returns on Investment for a More Resilient and Inclusive Europe. Some of the, uh, the followers uh, can remember his name because he's a uh, an author of a, a, a major volume about changing welfare states, uh, which sums up how welfare states um, in the recent decades have been transformed and transforming. And probably today we can also witness another transformation. And we also invited Liva Franzen, uh, to, uh, director of, of um, Europa Insights. Uh, by the way, she's also a former director of the European uh, Commission. Recently, she authored um, a study under the title Money Talks, Boosting Investment in Social Infrastructure. Welcome uh, to the panel. And uh, let me highlight again that um, uh, to put this uh, topic um, into the context of the COVID crisis, of course, uh, is um, a massive uh, challenge. And uh, I'm sure we will come to this. But first of all, I would like to invite Professor Hemerich uh, to introduce uh, the topic uh, based on uh, his study. And then uh, we will uh, listen to uh, the other panelists. Anton, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laszlo. Thanks for, for having me to, uh, to talk about um, uh, the report that we wrote earlier this, uh, this year. Um, I prepared a little PowerPoint. Can you see it? That's my first okay, question. I think it's kind of soon. Because I think um, somebody has to let me in with screen share. A few seconds, please. Yeah. And good morning, uh, Commissioner Schmidt. We met uh, at the OECD briefly uh, early, early December. And this was a time when um, there was no COVID uh, around the corner. Um, and I also mentioned to you then that we were publishing this uh, report, Social Investment uh, Now, um, and that it would be good to, to meet up uh, uh, for it. Um, but you know, now things have changed so dramatically. Um, so my presentation is very much um, looking to uh, what we wrote at the time, from the lens of the COVID crisis and how to approach it from, um, from the social policy uh, perspective. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. But uh, I want to share my PowerPoint mm -hmm. if I can. I think the colleagues are working on it. Yeah.
Yeah, should be. Mm -hmm. Do we have it here? Yes, apologies for the delay. Okay, fine, fine. So, so basically, um, I'm going to walk you through five points that I want to make. I mean, the bigger point is lessons of the Great Recession that I think we all know. Then I will sort of, you know, uh, focus in on the, on the core argument of the Social Investment Now report. And I will take that core argument into the current condition. You know, what is still relevant of what we said before and what may be less relevant or what kind of other type of emphasis uh, um, that we need now. Then before closing on, you know, what could be the role for DG employment, um, I want to highlight some of the fault lines that, uh, that we see currently um, emerging in the great lockdown. And then maybe we can have a discussion about to, how to resolve it. Um, we wrote this report you know, in, the, in the months of, let's say, September to November, and then it went into publication. And of course, you know, there was no corona crisis um, in, in the making. So this was a relatively optimistic time. And if I pick up on three lessons um, from the Great Recession, looking back uh, on, a, on a decade of major uh, change. I mean, the first and most important lesson, and I will show this in a couple of slides um, quantitatively later on, is that the European active wa welfare state really is the unsung hero of the Great Recession. And this is something that we should never forget. And remember, the Great Depression started as a financial crisis. The Great Recession was a financial crisis. It didn't turn into a depression because we had, you know, important buffers to um, to 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 protect our citizens uh, from from worse uh, conditions. So that's, I think, the first main lesson. The second lesson that in the process, I mean, it took some time, but but EMU really matured from a fiscal austerity club to a monetary insurance uh, uh, union. And if you look at sort of the writings and the speeches of Mario Draghi from the beginning of the crisis um, uh, until, you know, before he stepped down. I mean, you really see this U-turn on the monetary policy side. I mean, fiscal policy has been slow in coming um, and we'll, we'll talk about it uh, uh, later. Now, the other legacy of the Great Recession is that we are living in a world, and this will continue, um, of structurally low uh, interest rates. And this generates, and this is the core message of the report, this generates high multiplier returns on social investment, on social infrastructure investment. And that's another thing that we should not forget, especially in times of uh, COVID. Now, let me go a little bit deeper in, in why we should take social investment seriously. And here's a puzzle that I've been struggling with, you know, for almost a decade. I mean, if you look at employment rates uh, on this graph, I mean, one of the more surprising things is that in the, in the right-hand corner, you see countries like Sweden, the Netherlands, Germany, and Denmark, which actually did very, very well over the Great Recession uh, period with levels of employment back to where they were uh, earlier and some even much higher like, like, like Germany. And if you look at the dotted line, and this is the more surprising thing, you see that the US employment rate actually in the Great Recession went down massively and only recently has been picked up. And if you go back in time in the, in the late 1990s, the US together with Sweden had the highest levels of employment. And this is definitely no longer um, the case. If you if you unpeel the onion, I mean, one of the most surprising trends of the U.S., again, going back into time, I mean, in the 1990s, the U.S. had the largest share of female employment together with Sweden in the advanced industrial world. Today, it's especially female employment that has gone down in uh, the U.S. And what is you know, equally surprising that we know that the, the macroeconomic policy response to the Great Recession um, in, in, in Europe came rather late and, and the fiscal policy response uh, by, by Obama uh, and, 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 and later by Trump was much more aggressive. But this has not been translated into high levels uh, uh, of employment. And, you know, at the same time, you see 
the euro crisis is very clear how Spain um, uh, and, and, and Italy sort of, you know, made a, a deep dive in employment. But then, you know, Italy, I mean, Spain picked up, whereas Italy remained um, at the lower level. So this is a very important puzzle that, that we try to explain in, in, in the report. And here we do something different. Here we look at the y-axis, I think the employment rate is a very important uh, indicator. And on the other, the, the x-axis, we look at equity, which is the reverse Gini index. So it's an indicator of uh, inequality. And what you see here, again, in the right-hand corner, you see these big bubbles, big circles of welfare states that are able to reach above 70% of employment that are relatively big. I mean, the size of the bubble is the size of the welfare uh, uh, state. So they do well, relatively well, both in terms of equality uh, and in terms of employment. And when we focus in a little bit more uh, on, the, on, the, on the dark gray side and the light gray side of these bubbles, you see that also these welfare states and particularly Sweden um, and Denmark, they have a la large light gray uh, shade um, uh, uh, in proportion. Um, and that's the service side of the welfare state. That's not cash benefits, but benefits in kind. Now we look at Spain and, and Italy and Greece, you see that they do average in terms of equity. They have very low levels of employment and they do not have highly service intensive welfare states. So if you want to have a social market economy consistent to the European pillar of social rights, it's, it's really the service side of the welfare state that will probably help you to reach higher levels of employment. And this is something to bear in mind when we uh, um, uh, go down um, into the argument uh, a little bit uh, uh, deeper. And this led me to think about, you know, what is, what is behind, what is the logic of these decent levels of equity, high levels of employment? And I think here, the life course is central um, because, I mean, the evidence that we, we collected is, is, is very consistent with the following argumentation is that if you have good child, early childhood education and care, this has a knock-on effect on educational attainment. This has a knock-on effect on, on female employment and productivity. If that is being supported by good work-life balance uh, policies, um, there are higher levels of uh, employment. Is, if that is latched up with active aging uh, 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 policies, then you also have a, a higher exit age from the labor market. And you know, if you don't lower taxes in the meantime, you have more resources for poverty uh, protection and, and prevention. I mean, this is the sort of social investment life course multiplier effect that is consistent with these macroeconomic indicators that I used before to look at the sort of you know this this comparison between the US um, and 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 Europe and within Europe to look at the bubble graphs in terms of equity and um, and levels of employment. I think this is the core argument of the um, uh, of the of the report that we did. And so, if you would summar summarize this, you know, what is the sort of the optimal social investment policy mix, and you go into the details of these countries, the countries that do well are the countries that have inclusive buffers. So, you know, most people in the workforce are being protected. I mean, again, the comparison with the Nordics and let's say Italy, Italy buffers well in the sense they have a big buffers, but they basically only buffer pensioners and not, you know, young workers that just have a flexible uh, job. The other dimension on the, on, the, on, the, on the labor market and employment relations is that you need to have gender balance flows to ease these more heterogeneous and at the same time more risky life course transitions that we make in our post-industrial uh, societies. And what comes out very strongly, again, on the positive side is that you know, the countries that have truly lifelong human capital stock commitments 
um, you know, they are in this world where there really is no trade-off between equity um, and, 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 uh, and efficiency. And also what becomes clear, especially now when we include healthcare, that, you know, private funding for education and health, uh, you know, may not be, you know, the way uh, uh, forward. Now, our argument was made in, 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 the, in, the, in the light of, so what, what does this imply when we think about the EU budget and EU policy making? <coughs> and what we, what we thought about, and there are different versions of, the, of this in the report, is that, you know, we do a lot of open method of coordination, and that's all fine and well in terms of best policy practice sharing. But what you need to think about how you can incentivize this with you know, fiscal support. And here, our reasoning was the following. If you would be able to privilege long-term human capital stock investment, this is a long-term uh, 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 strategy with high rates of return for the whole of the European Union, and you do this in line with you know, helping member states to think more clearly about how their buffers could be made more inclusive while at the same time making labor markets um, more gender balanced, this, this is where you really have uh, an added advantage. And the, the, the thinking uh, of the report was very much, you know, if we could exempt, let's say, human capital stock investment from the stability and growth pact to incentivize domestic national policymakers to really ratchet up early childhood, active aging, um, then, you know, this would uh, reap, um, uh, you know, higher rates of, uh, of social investment returns. And, and that would then stabilize the macroeconomy uh, of the European Monetary Union and the European single market at large. I mean, that's the, the basic story. Okay, so then came COVID. And the question that I want to ask myself is, okay, does COVID, everything is changing right now, does it invalidate the argument that we, we made? And I would say not really, although I have some fault lines to discuss with you just you know, in a minute. I mean, first and foremost, I mean, sadly in a way, but COVID has made one thing very clear that you know, effective welfare provision, especially in terms of healthcare, is just like a sine qua non. And this impairs even further the kind of starve the beast austerity politics that we have been going through. I mean, in a way, ever since the 1980s, although, you know, we've shifted to social investment, but it was social investment also always with something like the break on it. Um, so that's the good news. I also think in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the policy changes, in the proposals that are done by Lagarde, that, you know, there is this EMU insurance union reinforcement going on, this, this, this deepening of the, of the EMU macroeconomy as an insurance union. We're not there yet, I'll come to that. And finally, you know, the low interest rate context that allows for this multiplier opportunity in terms of social investment is essentially fully intact. So there's no need to worry about that. Um, but, I mean, this is the sort of, you know, these are my doubts in a way. There are fault lines. And, and the, the most important thing to understand is that, you know, COVID has turned out to be a very, very deep and largely asymmetrical uh, shock. And essentially, we have seen increases in inequity, uh, um, you know, across countries, across regions, across risk groups, across gender, and what have you. And they they basically intensify inequalities and inequities that were already there. And I think this is something that we have to worry about. The other thing in terms of policy, there is the danger, we've seen it at the beginning, of sort of go it alone nationalism rather than differentiate it because, you know, if the shock is differentiated in consequences, you need differentiated policy solutions. But these policy solutions need to be coordinated and they need to be coordinated with a solid backing uh, uh, from the international environment and you know first and foremost the European Union and you know it's it's not for nothing that the word solid 
um, you know, comes from solidaristic or maybe the other way around. But, but I mean, uh, this is a very important point uh, uh, to bear in mind. And, and the question here is also, can the ECB carry the day in, in the shadow of a joint uh, decision trap in, in, in fiscal policy uh, measures? And, you know, I don't want to be pessimistic, but this looks a bit like, you know, the Weimar Republic uh, uh, revisited, um, you know, if, you, if we're not careful. Then there is something, and maybe this is justified, um, of, of political complacency. What we see now is, is massive emergency buffering. And the kind of thinking that goes beyond this is sort of, you know, we, we, we have to worry about stocks and flows uh, 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 later. But as we know, you know, we're all working from home these days. I mean, we as, as you know, uh, uh, educated uh, people with, with, with fancy office uh, jobs. So labor market flows are being reallocated on, on the fly in very heterogeneous ways. So the knowledge economy is really uh, intensifying as also adverse demographics uh, uh, intensify the pension uh, burden. So in other words, the short-term work success of Germany, which, we, which was really about buffer and stock policy in tandem, I think that you know, the flow dimension has to enter uh, the equation to avoid, which was what, what Europe was actually quite good at, as, you, as I showed in my first slide, to avoid scaring uh, um, uh, effects. And this kind of intricate management of stock flows and buffer policies, you know, they, they require quite taxing institutional capability uh, 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 for employment offices. And of course, we know that these institutional capabilities you know, um, uh, between Germany and, and Portugal are, are, are very different and, and we need to think about uh, uh, that. Above and beyond, uh, uh, you know, all this makes the Commission's Recovery Fund macroeconomic solid backing argument decisive in, in a way, compared to, com to be compared with whatever it takes uh, 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 momentum of uh, of Mario Draghi, and this not only for socioeconomic reasons, social imbalances, competitive divergence, which is going to sort of you know haunt us, but also for 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 liberal democracy, because these are hard times for the EU and liberal democracy to really prove their resilience. And I think uh, this can be done, but you know we're we're walking on a very tight rope. So what does this imply just as a thought experiment for DG employment now? And I think the first thing to say, which is a bit in contradiction to what I said <laughs> just in the previous slide is that don't enter this fiscal trench warfare debate that is ongoing, uh, but frappe toujours the positive macroeconomic externalities of social investment. That evidence is much stronger than the trade-off and trilemma logics that are floating around in, in the literature and that are also still dominant in, in some of the other directorates um, in, the, in the European uh, Union. On that ticket, champion social cohesion and regional funds in the expanded, I mean, I think the EU budget will be expanded on a strong social investment template because that's where the evidence was and I think still uh, is. And then more empirically, actively monitor emergency buffers, new flow patterns and, and, and stock uh, uh, decisions that are being taken at the, at the, at the member state uh, level in order to report on social progress and looming inequities, because these looming inequities are the thing to worry about. And it, it, this, is, this should be done in a way as if it were the weather report. I mean, I was kind of shocked uh, the, 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 uh, earlier, I mean, last week when the Italian government and then later the Spanish government said, you know, we're going to close schools until September. That means that, 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 that kids do not go to school for about half a year. We know from, from research that, you know, that has huge consequences in learning capabilities learn, uh, later on and the learning capabilities has huge consequences for educational attainment, for productivity and so on and so forth. I mean, in the Nordics uh, and in the Netherlands, you know, we are opening schools 
before we 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 open for 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 other uh, uh, dimensions of the economy, and that's more of a long term uh, uh, um, uh, perspective. And I think now that we have the European pillar of social rights, um, this is the, the sort of the, the 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 ideal normative template to look at these new stock flow uh, and, and buffer patterns um, uh, as a normative uh, uh, template, uh, um, uh, as, a as, a, as a template to, to assess uh, what's going on and, and, and also to, to, to think about creating what I've called a holding environment for active welfare states uh, 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 to flourish. And I think on the basis of this kind of collecting of evidence, there's a there's a real need to engage, uh, and I think DG Employment has done has done this many times before uh, um, uh, to initiate the articulation of a post-COVID welfare uh, uh, settlements with with uh, 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 engaged scholars, of which there are many. I mean, just not not simply myself. Um, and I leave it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Anton, for this presentation. Um, I apologize again for the technical difficulties at the very start. Uh, now I believe uh, everything is fine and the audience should also feel free to tweet uh, some of the important messages uh, which um, they come across in this um, uh, discussion. Um, I think there have already been quite a few uh, key messages uh, delivered in the presentation about um, the the whole concept of social investment and how this should this should reformulate uh, the function and the functioning of um, uh, the welfare uh, state uh, the life cycle approach i think was really uh, fascinating as you presented and um, i think it was also highlighted why uh, beyond um, the issues that have been mentioned uh, this discussion is so topical it is because now under the COVID emergency, uh, a new concept of the multi-annual financial framework is going to be introduced, which will affect how the European Union can um, uh, influence and assist the social investment capacities of uh, the EU uh, member states. But now uh, it is the time to invite Commissioner Nicolas Schmidt uh, I believe, Nicolai, you have been inspired uh, by uh, the presentation of Professor Hemerich, and uh, you entered office a couple of months ago with a very ambitious um, agenda. Some key elements have already been put um, uh, forward, and you also responded very quickly to the crisis created by the coronavirus. Uh, Nicolai, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Laszlo, and thank you very much, Anton. Uh, I think uh, you have shown it. Uh, uh, your, report, your report came before the corona crisis, but I think uh, the corona crisis, in a way, confirms absolutely uh, the conclusions and the analysis of your report, because uh, we uh, experience now how important social investments are for our societies, how necessary they are, and also uh, comparing, comparing, and you have done it especially also with the United States, and you can also compare it to a country like, uh, for instance, uh, the UK uh, and others, how uh, the resistance of countries uh, is very much linked to the level of and the strength of the social investments and the strength of the social uh, welfare system. So I, I think that uh, this crisis at least uh, should give us uh, one important lesson. Uh, I, I hope that we will uh, work on it, uh, that beyond uh, what has been always the core objectives of the European Union, very much centered upon competition, competitiveness, and finally also in some way in our economic system profit uh, maximization, there is some other dimension. And this uh, dimension, uh, you have chosen that for our conference, that's the resilience. Resilience of our societies, but at the end also the resilience uh, of our 
uh, of our economies. And I think this has been uh, very much illustrated by the present crisis. So uh, we have taken, uh, or you, uh, governments have taken important decisions uh, at the beginning of uh, this crisis, which is also some strong signal. I think mm -hmm. uh, putting human and well-being of people before econo uh, the economic uh, uh, dimension. This is, I think, this is something very important, uh, showing also that uh, in our societies there, there are values still, and this is, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. very important. Uh, so uh, we have governments have stopped uh, activities. Uh, they have put health before everything else, accepting also social and economic impacts, uh, which are, as we know, in terms of GDP, in terms of also, by the way, of unemployment, and I will talk about that, quite significant. Uh, and again, uh, I see uh, when I compare different countries now, also at the health uh, level, we see uh, that uh, uh, countries react or have reacted very differently, very in a very differentiated way to this crisis. Um, uh, and I think this depends also very much on the social systems, social infrastructures, the strength of the uh, health systems by, by the way the investments which have been done or not done, uh, UK is, is a good example. And so uh, countries are very differentiated in a very differentiated situation uh, in terms of equipment to resist to this kind of, uh, of shocks. So um, uh, now we are talking about the recovery. And I think this is... Uh, a very crucial moment. How should the recovery be organized? Uh, uh, the recovery should finally put people, keep people in the center. We should uh, work on this resilience, on this capacity to resist shocks. And uh, the recovery should not just be rebuilding what has been in the past. Recovery should be also uh, a more transform uh, transformative uh, process. And this means also that we have to integrate into this uh, uh, recovery very strongly uh, the Green Deal dimension, which has been, uh, which still is the big uh, project of this commission and uh, the just transition. Just transition means also the fairness and, uh, and the social, uh, a strong uh, social dimension. You have mentioned it. Uh, finally, our compass is now for Europe, the UN pillar of social rights. And I must say, uh, when the president of the commission started in her first speech and, and, and used this formula, an economy that works for people, meaning that puts fee people first and, uh, and values first, this is a, a change of paradigm now, uh, mm. because that's not uh, exactly what the uh, previous uh, neoliberal dogma said, because the neoliberal dogma is not putting people first, but puts uh, finally uh, markets uh, in the center of economic policies. And, 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 and there is a, a real change, which we certainly have to uh, give some concrete content. Now, the pillar's major objectives, uh, first promote the creation of opportunities and jobs for all, contribute to better working conditions for all, um, uh, to help strengthening social protection and fight poverty. You have mentioned all these dimensions already. Guarantee gender equality, which is a very important objective, uh, inclusiveness, non-discrimination, and good access to social services like health, education, and care. And finally, also social dialogue and collective bargaining, which also changes a bit uh, what had, uh, uh, what had uh, um, uh, taken place in the, in the past where social dialogue was not so much uh, uh, valued anymore. So uh, this is, uh, our, these are our objectives. Now we, we are working now on an action plan, which means that the objectives have to be translated in concrete policies. But we, when you are talking about concrete policies, you have also to talk about resources. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, uh, the MFF. Uh, that's now uh, a different perspective. We had different, difficult negotiations and no achievement, no uh, result in these negotiations on the MFF. Now, um, our approach is to strengthen the MFF, uh, to add to the MFF uh, a recovery a fund, uh, and uh, to use this uh, uh, additional funding 
to organize the recovery in the in the sense I, I've just uh, uh, mentioned, and uh, uh, and to strengthen finally the resilience, not only uh, the economy. Certainly, we have to relaunch the economy, but also the resilience of our societies and of our um, of our uh, of our uh, economies. So we our, our our first objective was save lives. That was the health dimension. That was. Uh, um, health before all other consideration, but it was also safe jobs. Because we all know that people who lose their jobs, uh, when we enter a, a system, and you have uh, uh, talked uh, about these scars, uh, when people enter into a system of uh, structural unemployment, it's very difficult to bring them out. And this is uh, also uh, a weakening of our, uh, of our economies and finally also of our uh, democratic system. So we have put into place now, it's not yet operational, but I hope that it will be soon. This uh, what we call SURE, which is a financing uh, mechanism of short term, uh, uh, short time work. So this is a bit different from what uh, uh, Laszlo had proposed, uh, but it's inspired by your proposal. It's an, an, an emergency system, uh, which uh, should help, especially the more, the weaker countries who have developed a uh, short time work also uh, to finance this because uh, we have seen that the amounts of money to finance this short time work are uh, uh, is, is 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 really uh, huge so uh, this is a first mechanism with 100 billion uh, euros where we can support especially the most vulnerable countries to uh, go on and uh, and maintain this short time work unless the recovery really uh, uh, takes off. So uh, this has to be done soon, rapidly. Uh, While well, the European Council has decided to uh, to uh, uh, that it should be become operational on the first of June, I hope that uh, this can be uh, respected. Uh, and it's important also. It, it's not just for the workers, employees. It should also cover uh, self-employed. Uh, but I add to that that. Uh, uh, this sure, this emergency system does not now uh, mean that we forget about Laszlo's idea, the uh, reinsurance and or, uh, unemployment benefit system, a permanent system. And I think this crisis has shown that we really need such a system. Uh, it's not easy to put into place, especially also the financial aspects, uh, but we have now to go on working on that. And I, I, I have taken the commitment with uh, my colleague uh, Paolo Gentiloni uh, to, to continue working on that and to put into place this system, which is not only an aspect of social stabilization, uh, but also maintaining a level of income for those who lose uh, their jobs, especially when a country is uh, in an asymmetric uh, uh, shock situation. And I agree, this, this uh, coronavirus is in a way symmetric because all the mem member states have been hit, but they have been hit in a very different way and uh, with a very different intensity. And this is not just uh, member states. Uh, we find also that this is also uh, uh, applying to regions uh, and probably also social uh, categories. Because when we uh, draw the conclusions out of this crisis, we will, and in the US it's very clear, we see it, uh, but probably also in Europe that the most uh, uh, dif dis disadvantaged uh, areas in, uh, in our member states are hit more than others. Now, the second point is young people. I think uh, uh, Lazo knows it. Uh, the youth guarantee had been uh, taken and the youth uh, employment initiative had been uh, put into place uh, during the previous crisis. Now, I think we have to relaunch it and we have to adapt it to this uh, to this crisis. How, what can we do about the young? Because the young will be the first victims in a way uh, of this crisis. Because uh, what happens, uh, companies will not hire immediately new workers, new employees, and those who are out uh, are the young, mainly the young. They will have uh, uh, a big burden uh, to, uh, to bear. So I think we, we need to work on this youth guarantee, on this uh, young uh, uh, unemployment initiative uh, uh, and to adapt it uh, to, uh, to the present situation. Now, there is another aspect, which is the overall transformation, because the overall transformation will go on. It's not because we have Corona that uh, the digitalization of our economy uh, has stopped. No, probably it will go even much faster. There will be an acceleration 
of this transformation, including also the Green Deal, uh, where I personally think that we have to push for it now very much, uh, also in the recovery uh, context. And this has an impact on jobs. Some jobs will be redundant, and many jobs will be totally transformed. And this brings us to an, uh, a very important topic, which is uh, uh, skills, because skills is an investment in people, an investment in competencies, um, and uh, making people finally more resilient individually. And uh, therefore, I think we have to devote much more resources to uh, skills policy. We are about to launch a new skills agenda. Uh, we want uh, finally a right for everybody uh, to be skilled, to be reskilled, to be upskilled. Uh, we know that our, uh, our, our labor markets are very mobile, uh, that everybody has to uh, go through different transitions. And I think uh, this can be only be accepted if we give people the tools, the rights, uh, the, the means uh, to uh, accept these transitions, because everybody has a right to security. And I think security is a, a major issue because insecurity uh, has uh, not only social consequences, but also political consequences, as we see in many countries where finally um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, populist uh, forces play on this feeling uh, uh, of uh, insecurity. So we, we have to work on, on the skills, on the, what we call the just transition, and skills is, uh, is a very uh, uh, important uh, part of that. Uh, now, uh, another point is uh, working conditions. We, we, we have launched now some special guidelines uh, due to the corona crisis, but I think we, we still have uh, to improve uh, the whole uh, set of working conditions, health and safety at work. I think this is something uh, Europe was very much committed to, and I think this is also an investment in security, uh, in better working conditions, uh, but also in, in some uh, kind of new approach uh, in, a, in, a, in the workplace. And, and therefore, uh, we want to really uh, continue on that, and I think Corona in, a, in that way uh, gives us also very strong arguments. Now, um, Wages uh, are another issue, and uh, I think we have uh, launched this idea of a framework for minimum wages in Europe, and I have no, no, no intention at all to postpone this, because uh, especially we have seen uh, that uh, wage setting is important and wage gaps are finally not really, as, as, they, are, as they stand now, are not acceptable, because those who have saved us, those who have been at the, in the front line are very often those who are not very well paid or even worse. And I think uh, that, that we need some uh, new reflection on the value of work, the value, the social value of work. And so I understand uh, all the uh, uh, people in the care sector, in the health sector, that they say now, well, we have done uh, what we had to do, but uh, sometime, uh, uh, the, the moment will come where the value of this work has to be appreciated. And that brings me uh, to uh, the point of social partners, social collective bargaining. That's also something which uh, should be brought back, much more back into the European, uh, into the European scope. And uh, I, um, I'm defending uh, a revival, a reinforcement of social dialogue, collective bargaining. That's also very much linked to the vision of an economy that works for people, but it's much more than that, because social dialogue is part of our democracy, is part of our social model. And we see that in those countries where the state of law is put into question, where democratic rights are diminished, these are also the countries where social dialogue is put into question. And I think uh, uh, Laszlo knows uh, exactly uh, what I'm talking uh, uh, about. Uh, a, a very short uh, 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 mentioning of, uh, of poverty. I think uh, you have said that the life uh, cycle, I think uh, yeah. <clears throat> the child guarantee, that's an investment, uh, a, a basic fundamental investment. I, I think a lot of, uh, 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 Anton, you have uh, done that, but uh, uh, Gosta Esping has done it. A lot of other uh, uh, scholars have, have worked on this idea of the importance of childcare, of quality childcare, of children's education, children's uh, health. So this is really an investment which has to be pushed. And that's also a situation where there, is, there are big differences in Europe. 
and 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 you and these differences uh, at, uh, in this life cycle mean that the differences finally they go on and and they become even more important uh, in 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 Europe. So I think this is uh, the launching the child guarantee uh, and and also providing. Uh, resources for implementation of the child guarantee, focusing on the low, on the most vulnerable and the most disadvantaged, is a big project for this commission, and uh, we uh, we are working on it. And uh, I hope that uh, we can also draw on your experience and your knowledge. Well, I will be very short on social economy. I I, I have had a discussion yesterday with uh, uh, a lot of stakeholders of social economy. I think this is also an element of resilience in our society, because we have all uh, experienced that during the previous crisis, social economy has been the most resilient uh, business model uh, in terms of employment, in, in terms of, uh, uh, of social services. So I think because they put values and purpose before profitability, so I think we have to work on this social uh, economy model. You, uh, uh, Laszlo, you had worked uh, uh, during your mandate on that, and we we take that up again, and uh, we will uh, we will do that. So uh, social in investment um, here, I think um, we have, and I think uh, Lieve Fransen uh, underlined in a study that the EU suffers from a social investment gap of uh, close to 150 billion per year, which is quite a lot, but compared to the the amounts of money which are now uh, in the discussion uh, uh, feasible, and I, I link that also to what Anton said on the on the overall uh, interest uh, rate uh, context. So I think uh, we have to relaunch the investment package, but giving it a more concrete uh, uh, dimension. So this is uh, exactly what uh, uh, we have uh, to do, and I regret very much when when the Juncker plan was launched, it was very much focused on everything, but the social dimension was finally, it was not completely ignored, but it was not really uh, a, 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 a real part of it. So uh, that, uh, as a conclusion, I want to say that uh, finally, um, we all know that uh, social investment is still considered by many as a cost uh, in terms of expenditure, uh, and also in terms of uh, economic and budgetary government governance in the EU, and this has to be changed. I think even the IMF has now recognized in a study, and it has been quoted by Christine Lagarde uh, recently, that uh, uh, social investment is important, not only for social purposes, but also for economic purposes. And uh, you have shown that, uh, especially linked also to the labor market, in a very uh, a concrete uh, uh, way. So, creating a, a, a socially fair recovery, we have to have a strong ESF plus. So we have to increase the means. If we want to have this social uh, recovery, we have to have a stronger ESF. Uh, we have to, uh, to, to develop also the European Globalization Adjustment Fund uh, and uh, the recovery fund, uh, which has to have a strong dimension. When we talk about this recovery fund, it cannot be uh, limited to a few hundred uh, billions. We have to really have it at a, at a high level. Some talk about 10% of GDP, so a, a real important level um, uh, in order really to not only to intervene in the, in the transitions, green transitions, the economic relaunch, but also in terms of social uh, investment. So um, I think uh, we, I, I fully agree with the analysis that uh, um, there are risks uh, ahead of us. If we are not doing that, if we are not investing now in our social networks, in our welfare systems, in more, in, uh, in more equality, uh, there is a risk uh, uh, not only for a social crisis, but also for a political crisis, and even a risk for the European integration process. And uh, even the, the chief economist uh, of the IMF has warned us, saying, well, uh, this, this recovery has to, be social, has to have a social uh, dimension, otherwise we, we are running a risk of uh, social crisis and, 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 and unrest in, in, in many countries. And, and we have seen, even before the corona crisis, that uh, this can be uh, very real. 
So I think uh, we have now the opportunity to further change the paradigm, uh, to strengthen the European social model, uh, to put forward and to push forward uh, social investment through uh, the pillar of social rights, which finally is a, a way how to make uh, European societies, but also the whole European Union, a more resilient uh, union, a more resilient uh, uh, entity. And finally, uh, to combine an innovative economy, a sustainable economy, because sustainability has now been part of our economic governance and social governance, uh, and uh, to combine so innovation, innovative economy, and uh, a strong uh, social and uh, strong uh, welfare state. So this is at stake. This is what we have to try to do. We have to convince member states, but I think we have good arguments. And the arguments are those uh, which we see every day. Uh, and I think the crisis, the corona crisis, uh, should be the best argument in that respect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicola, uh, for uh, this um, uh, presentation of the broad spectrum of um, employment and social policies in these difficult uh, times. I can only agree that um, there can be many lessons learned from the previous crisis, but obviously uh, every crisis is different and uh, there has to be innovation, as you explained. Now, uh, the next uh, speaker is Irena Tinagli. And I'm really glad that she joins this um, discussion because there have been many connections made, starting by Professor Hemery, between the social situation and how the monetary union functions. And that the functioning of the EMU also defines, in a way, the challenge for uh, the welfare systems in uh, various uh, member states. Um, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Good morning, Nicolas, Anton, and thank you so much. And this is a very interesting discussion. It goes at the heart of the values and the meaning of the European Union, I think. And I really appreciate what you said about, you know, our social economy model. And I think um, many of the things that are emerging now uh, make us think and realize what the European Union is really about, what are the values that we care the most, and uh, frankly, I'm really happy and proud of the fact that uh, European institutions and uh, our member states, no one of us, of our union, had uh, their leaders saying we have to get used to have some of our beloved ones to die. And I'm proud that uh, no one of us said anything like that and that our actions were to try to protect the citizens uh, and the societies as much as we could, as fast as we could. And of course, there are many things that we have to work on, that we have to improve, that we have to build. Uh, we know there, you know, Nicola said it very well, there are many instruments that uh, we, we still have to reinforce or create, and this is uh, what we will uh, talk now, but let's start from this very important uh, issue, the values that are coming up now, what is bringing us together, what we really care about. And I agree that there is also a, a, a political meaning, I mean, showing the European citizens uh, that uh, we do care that the European Union is also a social union, cares about the citizens, is not simply a monetary union, it's not simply, you know, about trade, uh, but it's about uh, human beings and uh, providing security. I think this is fundamental. This is what most citizens have been expecting. Uh, sometimes they've been, they felt disappointed, and now it is our turn to show that this is not the case, that we are working to make the European uh, Union uh, work for people, you know, as that we said, we were saying, uh, making an economy, yes, but an economy that works for people. You know, this was our uh, uh, idea. So um, that said, um, I, I, I would like to expand on the relationship, however, between the social investments and also the economy, the competitiveness. I mean, Nicola said uh, we've been thinking too much probably about the markets, about competitiveness, about productivity, not enough about people. And I, and I think he's right. But I will bring, I will add an economic argument to that. 
uh, because I, I want to argue that what we've learned uh, in these last years and what we are learning now, what we should be learning, is that caring about people, empowering people, making sure that we have safety nets, that we can provide skills, all of this is fundamental for competitiveness, is fundamental for the single market, is fundamental for the monetary union. And that's for, you know, I'll just say two or three main things. Uh, first of all, it is important, uh, important uh, the resilience that Nicolas was talking about is important for the economy and we can see in these weeks, economies cannot go back to normal economic life uh, if they are not capable of addressing the healthcare emergency as soon and as effective uh, as possible. So this is something I tried to say from the very beginning. At the very beginning, many of course were scared about putting in place uh, street uh, you know, restrictions on some economic activities because of, you know, we were trying to contain the contagion, but the two things go hand in hand. And I think it was good for, you know, many of us trying to make policymakers understand, and I think most of us understood it quite quickly, that the sooner and the more effective you would address the health emergency and the sooner you could back, go back to economic normal life. Uh, so this is very important. The resilience of these societies is crucial and fundamental for a fast uh, economic recovery as well. So the, how you organize the healthcare services is very important, how you uh, work also locally in the regions. These was, are all important things, the services you provide. The second thing, uh, talking about, you know, social investments is uh, also about not only healthcare, but for example, uh, Nicolas mentioned that very well, the skills, services that help people to enter uh, or to stay or go back into jobs to upgrade their uh, knowledge and competences. All of this is fundamental for competitiveness. Uh, many economists didn't manage sometimes to recover fast enough because they didn't have systems and services that, are, that were capable of upgrading their workforce fast enough. This is what we saw for existence in Italy or Spain. We struggled more to upgrade uh, the skills of the workforce. And this is a problem that is dragging down productivity that is creating problems for competitiveness. And uh, these are the crucial things that allow us to diminish the divergences inside the European Union. And we know how important this is. We cannot have a strong monetary union if we keep having this kind of divergences in the economies. So, uh, monetary policies, fiscal policies, or social policies, they have to go hand in hand, because otherwise we would go to different paths and it would not be sustainable over time. So we need to really make this clear. I think that there is a lot of awareness that is coming up, that came up also after the last crisis, and I hope, you know, uh, sometimes we say that the crisis is a, a learning opportunity, and I hope that at least we can learn this from the current crisis that we are facing. And we can't let these divergences happen this time, because this time it, it will be devastating, because many countries haven't still fully recovered from the past crisis. So we have to make sure to intervene now to make sure that these divergences do not happen, do not widen furthermore. So I, I think this is very important to remind us and, uh, and what, what can we do now. But first of all, I think we should insist in um, uh, making everybody understand that social uh, infrastructure is a real investment for competitiveness for the European Union. And this is not clear to everybody yet. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes, you know, now we are seeing, we are paying the price for the fact that in the past we've seen certain types of social uh, expenditure or social infrastructure, we've seen them more as an, a, an expenditure rather than an investment. And, uh, and this cannot happen anymore. Of course, we have to be selective, we have to be clear, we have to set out 
models for delivering this uh, social infrastructure in the right way to put them in place to help those countries that didn't have the capacity to put in place. Anton's presentation was very enlightening when it was showing the different mix of uh, uh, you know, welfare policies, the cash benefits versus uh, the cash transfers versus the services. This is a long-standing problem, so we have to tackle it. We can't turn our head away. There are some countries that have problems in, uh, don't have the capacity. And for example, I see with the Youth Guarantee. Youth Guarantee was a great program because it forced and it, teached, it was teaching some countries to set up services that they didn't have before. So we are creating, if we invest in these programs, we create the capacity in certain countries to have services for, uh, for the welfare, for social infrastructure. And this is the direction we have to uh, insist and move on. So not only for youth, but for workers, skill upgrading, uh, employment services, we have to do healthcare and redesigning this uh, uh, welfare. We have to do that and think about these infrastructures as real infrastructures, as investments for uh, competitiveness, for making the EU uh, stronger, also as an economy. And uh, we can do that. We can take advantage of all these new programs that Nicolas was mentioning. We have to make sure that these programs will be funded, will be supported, will be long term uh, they cannot we cannot expect this program you know, to make all the effort to put in place to put in motion what it takes to create this infrastructure and then cut everything in one year or two we have to make sure that there is a follow-up that there will be the time to create and make this infrastructure function well and get the returns as every investment you know nobody would ever think of building bridges and then shut them down after one or two years when you're still finishing the infrastructure, right? So we need to have this long-term uh, vision and view and uh, we will need to adapt and think of our next MFF uh, accordingly. Uh, we will have to create the space for this social infrastructure. We will have to adapt and review the instruments that we already had. Uh, uh, Nicolas rightly, rightly mentioned the Juncker plan, unfortunately, didn't have enough of attention to these things, but InvestEU could be an opportunity to expand. Uh, we did manage also in Parliament to add and include some in, uh, social infrastructure a pillar, but we have to expand on that and insist on the importance of this of social infrastructure. And then we will have to take the opportunity of this new recovery fund uh, to, uh, you know, start to set the, the pillars of, a, uh, of some important, relevant uh, social infrastructure for the future that uh, will be uh, crucial for the recovery, but also for the new Europe. It's not just uh, the recovery for these two or three years, but what I mean to say is that we have to take this opportunity to build the new Europe, the new, uh, you know, uh, social economy model that we had in mind, and that, you know, we never stop believing it, but uh, we are still not quite there, and uh, we have to keep pushing, and that is why I really thank you for this uh, work, for the study, for this opportunity to exchange ideas, and I really hope and I'm sure that Nicolas in the Commission will help us to push this idea forward because this is what we need to make the European Union stronger and more resilient. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Irene, for this intervention. Um, I think um, you highlighted quite a few major issues, including divergence which is um, uh, an issue we have to come back to later, not only in social policy debates, but also on economic policy. But now I would like to invite uh, Lila Franzen, uh, who was um, some time ago uh, the main author of the social investment package. And as a medical doctor, I'm sure she also has uh, insight about um, the current uh, situation with uh, the pandemic. Lila, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. 
Um, a lot of very interesting, very positive things have already been said. So I'm going to try to um, be short, but I, I want to base my presentation on two reports. First, the PRODU report, Boosting Investment in Social Infrastructure, and the second, Money Talks, that has just been published uh, in Public uh, Service Futures. So more information can be found there because I will really have to be summarizing this. But uh, both reports and, and also uh, previous work with Ander in, our, in the previous commission, we really showed how, I mean, it shows that this, this crisis really is exposing now the results of decades of neglect. And it made us less, less resilient to confront the COVID epidemic. But I, start, I hope that this epidemic will also be the start of a transformation. And what I hear from the, uh, the commissioner now, uh, and what I see already from the commission itself, reacting uh, and acting is, is very promising. I, I therefore hope that we not only talk about recovery, but we also uh, make sure that we deal, we are still in the midst of an epidemic. The epidemic is not going away. We might have to go back to work, we might have to go back shopping, but the, it, it is not over until uh, we have a vaccine and everybody gets vaccinated. It will not really be over. So we need to deal with the emergency and the long term and the recovery at the same time, which will, will be really a challenge. The high level task force um, under President Prodi showed very much how investing in social infrastructure is needed and in ma massive investment is needed after 10 years of austerity. The report also make long-term recommendations not only about the funds but also about the transformation that is needed on social investment in a knowledge society and digital transformed in a digitally transformed world. We reported in a way that the um, commissioner already referred to that that a minimum of 150 billion euro is needed to fix the gap. That means 1.5 trillion euros between 2020, 2030. But that should be possible. That sounds a lot, but that should be possible. And surely it should be done. And the, the Commission's proposals then with the cohesion funds and the social window of the Invest EU, we should not forget, we had for the first time a social window in Invest EU, and exactly what the, 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 the parliamentarian Irena said, the Juncker plan didn't attack or didn't address social investment or social in infrastructure, and also didn't really invest in the countries or the regions that needed it most. But Invest EU brought a new hope. It proposed to bring 4 billion euro in the social package, in the social, uh, and that would finance 50 billion euro in social infrastructure. So I hope we don't forget that. The, what we also said in the, what we also worked on and what the commission ad adapted is basically to crowd in private funds and to mix, blend different resources. So the cohesion funds, the local funds, the private funds can work together in a sim similar direction under the guidance of public policy makers, of course, and very much focused for the first time also on local authorities and on crowding in funds from, private, from public banks. That is a new thing, and I think we will need that also in the recovery funds and in the, in, the, in the way forward. So in the recovery, we will need a level of ambition that is even bigger than what we had in our report, and we need a mix of guarantees, loans, and grants, because otherwise we will not get there. And we need to do this quickly. That's I'm always afraid of with, with the instruments in the commission that we reinvent and, and spend time on reinventing, uh, whereas a lot of is in, in place, and we should just front load, front load resources and use what we already have because the debt burden that we will inherit from the COVID crisis should not again tie many countries down in further fiscal consolidation and punishing the social sectors. That is the fear 
that I have if we don't present this, uh, if, if we don't uh, do this right. <clears throat> now, Anton already referred to, to the whole social investment, so I'm not going to, and, and we, we already went into that in 2013, and you, you have really refined the thinking and, the, and, the, and the, the evidence there. So I will not go into there, but I just want to say something on the social infrastructure. Social infrastructure only represents 10% of what is needed for social policies, of course, but it is an important 10%. And it also not only refers to bricks and mortar like hospitals and schools, but it also refers to energy efficiency, make the houses energy efficient. That is like the Green Deal. Uh, make connectivity between houses and schools and nursing homes. New technologies are there and we see now how we are forced to do this quickly uh, under COVID, but it was already proposed to do this and we didn't take up enough of that. Another thing that infrastructure, where are the supplies? We, our supplies, the doctors in the hospitals didn't have masks, didn't have blues. I mean, all of this is incredible that we cannot produce something like this, that in time, and that we have to wait for imports from Wuhan to make this happen. So rethinking the production and the supplies is very, for strategic supplies is very important also. The good news is basically that Europe still leads the way with our social models and what the Commissioner proposes with SURE and hopefully Ando's proposal that we had so much problems in bringing forward, maybe uh, bringing this now forward in the longer term for, uh, it shows very clearly how Europe still leads and continues to lead when you compare the COVID impact in the US or in India or in Africa where I'm involved it is really the social models that protect our people, but not all of them. And the inequality is increasing under COVID. And that is, is, is very sad. But however, the consequences of the disinvestment we show, show now. When, when I looked at the data, Germany, for example, had before the COVID 29 critical care facilities and the personnel, the personnel that goes with it. So they didn't have an over, overcrowding of um, I have somebody else uh, bringing other slides, but this is not the slides that I propose not to work with slides for the moment so that it, I don't spend too much time. But Germany had 29 critical care facilities, while Italy only had 12, Spain 10, and Greece 6. This is the result of cuts that were made, and sometimes, sadly, also of some of the recommendations we made in the semester. The semester is a very important tool, but we need to get it right. Uh, and some of the recommendations are not always going in the right direction or when I was there didn't really always go in the right direction. Greece only had six beds, emergency beds for, for thousand people. Luckily, we, Greece showed real leaderships this time, leadership in, com, in, com, in preventing the COVID-19, really by being there very early and by using the um, using the, um, the epidemic to really enact long overdue reforms aimed at both protecting citizens, health, education, modernizing state. Being early, they didn't really require, not yet, the beds that they didn't have. In the meantime, they have obviously also increased the number of beds, doubled the number of intensive care beds, but they also digitalized uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, tele in telemedicine and teleeducation in the meantime. So they use this very positively uh, while not really being prepared, but probably a long experience in, in, in difficult environment has helped them. Now in telemedicine, even in Belgium, was very difficult to, to get going. Now in the meantime, this has really become the normal. Uh, so the crisis has catalyzed, in a way, major, major changes that we asked for and that we suggested for a long time. Manufacturing capacities for strategic products is now on the agenda of the Commission uh, and hopefully will become a longer term uh, approach. There's also very creative contributions, I, I find, 
there is a, a citizen-based contact tracing. Surveillance is important. A lot of people are afraid of surveillance, but surveillance is always important in public health. But there's different ways of doing surveillance. And the way that Valencia has done this now with citizens-based contact tracing is really an example how people or creative contributions can be made from outside of the social sectors in a way by a AI, but totally uh, respecting the, sur the surveillance and power, how surveillance empowers a single and all-powerful government or a wider range of citizens' organizations. Surveillance can go both ways. Then learning. I will stop it at this, but I can say a lot of other things on all of the other areas, of course, that are important in social policy. But learning, uh, Anton, you already referred to this, learning and school, schooling and lifelong learning. A lot of us are used to work at a distance and distant learning. And children in our houses very often can uh, are adapted to this quite easily. But a lot of kids don't have this. A lot of people that need to do upskilling and lifelong learning don't have these capacities or, or the space even in their house to do uh, these things. So it is very important to, to make sure that the COVID doesn't increase further the disproportionately the uh, disadvantaged children. Um, the same is true for housing. Housing, uh, we have not done the best with homeless people, with migrants and COVID distance, distancing in, in this uh, uh, COVID epidemic really makes it difficult for uh, people that don't have the spaces that we have and that are living on the streets. So I hope that this crisis really made it, will make the driving the driver for change and that the EU institutions will show leadership to rapidly and wisely reinvest in the people's security in their health, education, well-being, housing, livelihoods, robust service, social services, including strong public health services. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lira, for uh, these very clear uh, messages. Um, I think you were very convincing about uh, focusing on the social investment, not only in the crisis time, but especially in the so-called good times, when there are resources for um, investment, and one can be more forward-looking and not only act under an emergency. Now, uh, we have been already collecting quite a few questions. Uh, from uh, the audience, I should say from the floor. Uh, however, uh, because of Labour Day coming tomorrow, I thought that the first intervention from the floor should come from Per Hilmerson, uh, who is the Deputy uh, Secretary General of uh, the European Trade Union Conf Confederation, and I can see already him uh, over there. Uh, per, the floor is yours. Uh, what is the trade union perspective? Uh, on these questions which have been discussed today. Thank you, Laszlo, and thanks, uh, FEPS, for the opportunity for the ETUC to say a few words on this important issue and research. Um, of course, the ETUC can sign up to the, to the proposal in the, in the FEPS report, and of course, also what Commissioner Smith has, has said. I think we all can agree that the, the crisis has shown the need for a strong society, strong public sector, strong welfare states, and also, of course, a strong European cooperation. Uh, the EU is playing an important role in the emergency and in the recovery to come. One concrete example of this is the SURE instrument, which Commissioner Schmidt uh, mentioned. Uh, we believe that the EU needs a clear, ambitious and coordinated recovery plan with massive fiscal stimulus, otherwise we risk facing a huge and long-lasting recession and unemployment. So we need a rapid agreement on uh, an ambitious new multi-annual financial framework, the MFF, and we're looking forward to the proposal from the Commission in the coming weeks. The E2C actually criticized the Commission proposal for the next MFF presented two years ago for not being enough. Uh, to face the challenges such as social convergence and the implementation of the European pillar of social rights. We also criticized that the proposal would lead to a reduction of cohesion policy funding. So the upcoming proposal needs to be more ambitious, of course. And uh, the announced increase of this EU long-term budget up to 2% of GNI 
uh, and providing a balance of loans and direct grants to member states, workers and companies, it goes in the right direction. So we, we, we are hopeful uh, of this new uh, proposal to come. It's also important that the European Social Fund will have enough money so that it, it can continue to play a key role both in supporting the creation of new quality employment and in promoting uh, social inclusion. We also call for extra financial resources for the youth employment initiative that will help the member states to focus on quality employment for young people. I would like to very briefly mention three other areas for investment and support by the EU budget, but also of course national budgets. Uh, the first is that we need investments in public services and infrastructure to build resilience and the capacity to withstand a possible second wave of the coronavirus and other future unexpected shocks. Uh, we think that strong public services not only help countries to cope with these situations, but also helps them to recover more quickly, both economically and socially. Secondly, we need to support, and this has been said by previous speakers, we need to support the reskilling and upskilling of the workforce. Uh, this will be a key, a key ingredient in uh, adapting the labor markets during the time of the corona crisis, but also to make sure that Europe emerged from it stronger and more competitive. So member states should build up or strengthen job transition support systems with support from the European Social Fund. And thirdly, we also need to support social dialogue and collective bargaining in Europe, as uh, Commissioner Schmidt, uh, Schmidt said. Previous crisis has shown that countries, countries with strong social dialogue systems manage economic shocks and difficulties better than others, and it helps creating more inclusive and sustainable growth. So there should be a specific fund at EU level within the European Social Fund dedicated exclusively to capacity building for, of social partners for social dialogue and collective bargaining. My final point is that uh, tomorrow is the 1st of May, and we celebrate uh, Labor Day and solidarity between countries and workers. Um, workers are heroes and the victims of the coronavirus crisis. And there is no way that we can go back to business as usual. We need a massive and ambitious European recovery plan to tackle unemployment and poverty, to raise wages and improve working conditions. And we need a safe return to work and quality jobs for all. Thank you very much. Thank you much, Per. I think this was very, very clear. And we have seen in the last couple of weeks that um, the resilience of Europe actually depends on labor. And the labor of many people have been not sufficiently appreciated um, in the past period. And that approach also has to change. The next speaker is Maria Joa Rodriguez, the president of um, FEPS, former member of the European Parliament and former minister from Portugal. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, hello everybody. Great pleasure to be with all of you, very good friends. And uh, of course, on behalf of FEPS, our gratitude to have uh, these uh, full range of the key actors of uh, social Europe. So uh, I pay uh, very detailed attention to all your interventions. This is a great moment of discussion. And let me come uh, with some uh, uh, comments from my side in, in the following terms. Um, the concern with social investment. Yes, this is a, a long-term undertaking we have been involved in, and we do need to stick to this priority, but we also need to see how this is working now. Because before the COVID crisis, we were, let's say, in a development mode and a convergence mode. Irene made this point very well. And we were just overcoming some mistakes of the past where during uh, the Troika uh, times, many important social investments were just cut in health, education, and so on. We're recovering from this. Now we are confronted with something new and we are in crisis mode. We are in crisis mode. It, it, and this has a lot of implications. Because I'm assuming that so far, 
we are still in the phase of uh, responding to the shock. There is a big shock still underway and which uh, might become even bigger. At the same time, yes, we need to prepare for recovery, but for us recovery does not mean to go back to the past, as Nicola was saying, is about preparing the future and changing our future. And these two things are combined now. But I repeat, we are still in the phase of anti-shock. And uh, we need to make it clear for all the political actors that this time, the crisis has such big proportions that uh, we see a big paralysis of economic activity creating many social problems and increasing social inequalities. This is first. But secondly, we need to make it clear that the best way to prevent a dangerous downward spiral of economic activity is to strengthen our social models. We need to make this argument clear for everyone. And that's why I'm so happy that Nicola Schmidt launched this SURE instrument, because this is going straight to a huge emergency, which is to save jobs. The same time we are uh, saving lives, we must save jobs. Um, secondly, uh, we are still in big difficulties regarding poverty increasing everywhere. This is just the start. So in the emergency phase, anti-shock phase, we really need to strengthen our safety networks to deal with poverty and particularly with child poverty. So yes, this is a big moment to launch the child guarantee. This is now, for sure. But then we need to have in mind the recovery phase with transformation. And I believe there is a big opportunity uh, because this is happening right now. We have many companies, many workers, saving their jobs because they are going digital. And by going digital, they become also low carbon. So this is a kind of a shortcut to go to the new Green Deal. And we need to support this trend. This is a huge uh, social experimentation and a huge social learning process. We should support this with the proper skills, agenda, innovation, industrial policy. But again, there is a risk of a big social divide because some workers, some companies, some students, they can make this qualitatively and others don't. So uh, we need to have a powerful uh, education, social and industrial policy to make this possibility open to all. Uh, that said, in order to finance all these, I think we have a big issue on the table. And this is about the recent um, decisions of the European Council. Uh, we understand that the current European budget is not enough. It needs to be redirected and it needs to be strengthened. From my viewpoint, the recovery fund is an instrument to strengthen the European budgetary capacity, should be treated like that. And uh, if this is understood as an instrument European budgetary capacity, it should combine loans and grants. Because this is part of all budgets in the world, all budgets in the world, all public budgets, they count on loans and grants. Uh, and I believe that if we don't have the right mix, we'll have much bigger divergences coming in the European Union. My last comment is about the following. This time we need to have a powerful political uh, force pushing for this agenda. 
Uh, and I believe this is not only for politicians, even they are very important in this story. This is not only for trade unions. This must be for citizens at large. And that's why I think the message of the European of Pillar Social Rights must be recalled because the message is very simple. All European citizens must count on a common set of social rights. And this is a political issue. And I believe this must be put on all the process we are preparing regarding the Conference on the Future of Europe. This is the moment to put this on the table because otherwise I really fear for the future of the um, European Union. My last point is a question mark for the topic of this uh, webinar. In these conditions, we are in crisis mode, which should be the priorities for social investment? I think they should be about ensuring inclusive public health services. Secondly, it should be about developing a strong care services sector. Uh, this is really badly needed and it can create many, many jobs and should be organized in professional terms. This has an incredible value. The third priority should be about skills to prepare for uh, the Green Deal combined with the digital solutions. The, the leap forward can be made now and is happening already now involving millions of people. So let's build on this. So I think somehow we need to um, adapt our agenda for social investment. And I really think that these priorities should be exempted from the stability and growth pact for the next years, for sure. Thank you very much again, and let's go on working together. Uh, thank you very much, Maria, for this intervention. Um, and uh, now, um, the difficulty is the following, that we have been planning a Q&A. There are many questions uh, and I think we can add 10 to 15 minutes, uh, a few live questions, uh, but also I encourage everyone to use the chat box to reply to the questions because there will be no time to present everything uh, live. I wonder if Commissioner Schmidt still has a little time for at least two questions to come from two young uh, researchers. Uh, one of them would be Robin Ugnon Noel, uh, who is a co-author uh, of Anton Hemerich on an important paper on social investment. And um, another one is Francesco Corti, who would like to ask about how the European semester could be used better to tackle uh, the critical issues we spoke about. So uh, maybe the camera could be now uh, targeted to Robin and then to Francesco and we could ask uh, Commissioner Schmidt to reply. Hi. Where is Robin? Yeah. Oh, voila. Hi. Can you hear me? Very well. Thanks, thanks a lot for, for, for uh, leaving me the opportunity to, to take the floor and for engaging with a report uh, briefly very interesting yeah i'll, I'll put the, the question down also on the on the chat uh, but but basically i mean the question is on you know the pandemic has shown that there is a high need for decentralized response uh, at the same time we see that the, the institutional capacity uh, capacities are, are, are differing very very widely even in germany you know the, the, there's concerns about the the job, uh, job centers not being able to to to, to care i mean to address uh, so, so many demands so my question is very brief. At the time where you know we are considering rescheduling part, I mean shifting part of the EC funds of the, of the structural investment funds to 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 have a, to have a big priorities in terms of response. How do we make sure uh, we keep uh, having EU support on the ground where it's most needed in in, in these moments? So thanks a lot. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, is uh, Francesco there? Is it possible to pass the mic to Francesco Corti? If not, then uh, let me ask uh, Commissioner Schmidt to 
reply to this question we just heard? Oh, Francesco. Yeah. Please ask your question. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. My question is, uh, is really related to what uh, uh, Irene and Liv uh, Francena has pointed out. So the point of uh, divergence, because what the crisis and the pandemic has uh, pointed out is a huge social imbalances uh, within the EU that uh, have a, a kind of collateral effect of uh, dragging down competitiveness and productivity. Well, we know the European semester is the best tool, you know, to monitor social imbalances beyond macroeconomic imbalances. The point is that, I mean, uh, related to the example made by Liv France, and it's a while that Italy has been pointed out a problem with uh, care, critical bed, uh, bed and the uh, lack of intensive care, uh, still no action has followed. So what's the, uh, is there an alternative in this sense? What, how can this semester be used alternatively beyond monitoring to provide and actually steering member states uh, reforms? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Nicola, would you like to reply? And Thank you, you uh, very rapidly. Uh, well, I, uh, I think that uh, what has been said on, on unemployment, that will be a major challenge uh, in, 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 in many member states, but uh, certainly it will be bigger in some, uh, but it will be a, a real uh, issue in, in, mem uh, in all the member states. Now, we all know that uh, some countries have, for instance, you have mentioned one, uh, they have uh, a lot of reserves in their uh, public employment services, others have uh, less. So this is also a difference, a divergence, which uh, uh, creates uh, problems. So I think we have to, uh, to help uh, countries and uh, the case of uh, the youth guarantee was mentioned to uh, strengthen their public employment services, including uh, uh, better activation policies, and especially also including uh, the skilling element in uh, public uh, uh, employment services. So I think uh, this can be done uh, also through uh, a revamped uh, ESF plus. I think uh, uh, priority number one will be certainly in the forthcoming months uh, how to address the unemployment problem. And that uh, has also a, 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 a consequence on the semester. I think there, have, there has been a lot of uh, progress on the semester, especially on, on the social dimension of the semester during the last years. We have a scoreboard. Now, I, I would say we have perhaps to strengthen, revise the scoreboard, include more the issue of social investments in the scoreboard, and also uh, in, 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 uh, orient uh, the uh, uh, country-specific uh, uh, recommendation more in, the, in that direction. I think I, I have understood very well this difference between transfers and services, this is, I think, a very important issue. And uh, last point, uh, divergences. Well, this is the biggest issue in Europe, in, in the European Union, especially in the Eurozone. And uh, Irene has, has, has pointed that very much out. Uh, if uh, we need economic convergence, that's why this recovery fund is very important, because if we have uh, a different start in this recovery process, uh, from one country to another, in, divergences will increase. But at the same time, not uh, after, we have to work on social convergence. Both go together, both have to be addressed at the same time. And here, we certainly have to use the semester in a more uh, active uh, uh, and uh, targeted way. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um... Now we have a few minutes. I wonder if um, other panelists uh, would like to respond to uh, questions they have seen um, uh, in the chat box, or um, should I read um, uh, some of those? Um, there was a very interesting one, I would say, um, since uh, several uh, speakers mentioned the use guarantee and Freik, uh, uh, from Frianza was highlighting that uh, this concept received uh, uh, quite some criticism from the Code of Auditors, OECD, even some commission services, um, especially because of lack of uh, sufficient attention uh, to the most vulnerable uh, use. And um, this would need to be corrected uh, if the scheme is relaunched. 
uh, any thoughts on this? Or there was reference from Clive about a 2009 um, European Commission communication on uh, uh, health inequalities, uh, solidarity in health. And the question was, is this not the time um, quite urgently uh, for a new similar strategy and um, relevant measures? Panelists, Anton, any thoughts? Yes, I mean, I mean, on the youth guarantee, I mean, a student of mine is, is actually working on the youth guarantee right now, and he lives in Barcelona, where he's now, you know, working on his, on his research. And he found out that uh, the region of, uh, of, of Catalonia is actually cutting back uh, half of, uh, of, uh, of youth guarantee money. Now, that can be, in a certain context, justifiable. But, but as long as there is a commitment, we do this now for three months and then we go back to, to where we are truly committed to is to invest in, in the next generation. But, but I'd like to reflect just a little bit uh, on what Nicola Schmidt uh, uh, has, has said. And I think this is very important uh, also politically and I'll explain why. Uh, so, so he argues, I think rightfully so, although we all have to be very careful that, that values are back in, in the center. And when we look at sort of, you know, the European integration process uh, over the past decade, this was less about values and more about norms. Norms that are things that countries and, 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 and you know, people who may be unemployed have to abide by. It's sort of like, it's, it's a level of reciprocity. Um, and we also know that these norms, and you know, we, we all know them, the 3% and the 60%, that were supposed to deliver convergence, they did not deliver convergence, not before the crisis, but the Great Recession, and then into the crisis, it increased divergence and social imbalances. And I think the shift towards values, I mean, it's, values are less concrete, they're horizons, they're not sort of like, you know, this is what you have to do, and you have to do it by tomorrow. Um, but actually, there's more potential there to deliver on, 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 on uh, um, uh, convergence. And this goes, I think, to something that, that has also changed in recently is the way we think, I mean, I, I think for sure, about democracy. Because, I mean, we all know the famous quote by, by Jean-Claude Juncker saying, you know, we know exactly what to do. We simply don't, don't know how to get reelected. And, and, and that is sort of, we have to do the short-term solutions. People don't like it. They vote us out of office. That's not so great. That belongs to the old paradigm. We're now into a paradigm where we have to um, take citizens, political leaders, by the hand through very, very hard times, where the long term is really what is at stake. And there is immediate health needs, unemployment issues, but really, this is, a, this is a chance to define the long term where we want to go. And then we have to take citizens by the hand. And this is a completely different way of thinking about democracies than thinking about democracy as the only show in town is to how to get reelected. Um, and I think that's so fundamental, but it's also risky because if you place values at the heart, if you do the right thing, and I, I see, Conti and, and, and Lerbers, when they talk to the electorate, and they're doing really good jobs in taking the citizens by the hand in these difficult times. Um, but there has to be a sort of, the horizon has to sound real, has to sound practical. This is something that we can achieve. So it needs a, a political commitment that say, yeah, this is something what we, are not going to do, and this is my uh, uh, um, uh, 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 advice, is that we are going to fight whatever it takes, divergence. We've seen too much of it before the Great Recession. We've seen too much of it in the, in the wake of the Great Recession, and there's a real threat that this will become big again. And that's a normative commitment to which you know, social investment can, 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 can provide the instruments, but it's a very strong commitment to, 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 to make sure that we're not gonna make the same mistakes that we did in the past. And then you know, we listen to experts, uh, macroeconomists, people who do work on social investment, 
to, to find out and leave us Franzen's idea uh, on infrastructural investment, how to achieve that sort of no-go area of divergence. I think this is crucial. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I see that Liva Franzen would like to respond on health inequalities. If you wish, Liva, you can also tackle homelessness because there have been also explicit questions on homelessness. Um, go ahead. Okay. Um, on health inequalities, I saw a question from Clive asking, uh, should we make a new report? I think more than a report, um, it, what we need is much better understanding how the transformation is, is happening for the moment. And it is going in the, what is happening for the moment in the health systems, health services is the right thing but it's happening without real planning, without real somebody else had a real ecosystem about digital, uh, without real guidance, uh, because the commission's competences are very low in health. And actually, in my, one of my frustrations when I was uh, director in, uh, in, and, and in charge of, of some of the semester exercise was really that we didn't really have a, a serious framework on health to be able to, to, to really give the recommendations of the local authorities or the regional authorities in which direction health should be going. So a report, yes, but really an instrument to work towards social investment in health and transformation. Uh, the, the, the preparedness of countries is for the moment uh, and the resilience of countries and regions uh, in front of COVID is really a learning process. I'm amazed with when, when I look at all of these data and the different ways of, of approaching uh, health and health services and the, and, the, uh, and, and so, so it will really require serious analysis uh, to bring a report that is useful for uh, the European institutions to work in the, com in, in the semester on health, but I think it's highly needed. Uh, and it brings the short term together with the, the, the longer term and the investment and the services together. Uh, one, one lesson really that, is, that I take for, for granted already in COVID is that the countries that are prepared, but the countries that deal uh, with knowledge and data and transparency and empower people uh, and inform people regularly uh, is, is, uh, are those that make the best progress in a way. So also that the behavior uh, of politicians and experts are very learning, a learning process in health here. Uh, on homelessness, I just mentioned, of course, we've never, uh, I, I, for me, I tackle the homelessness very much from the perspective of the, 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 the social services and infrastructure and uh, provide homes first, uh, what Freik always uh, tried to push, uh, is the right approach. But what COVID shows now is that uh, these extreme situations of people in, in homeless, uh, homeless situations or migrants or the, 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 are, are really the, 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 those that we have not been able to protect. We have a good social model, but we have still a range of people that are, we've not been able to, to approach in the right way. And now we do haphazardly, quite quickly, something to try to protect the rest of the population by, by bringing them in shelters and houses. But uh, really, a longer term approach is needed in, in, uh, indeed uh, for in, instead of increasing uh, what is for the moment happening with homelessness is really it's increasing. And, um, and it's not, it's not a good thing for COVID, but it's also not a good thing for the society in general. So uh, we need to bring this together into the social investment, social infrastructure, but not as a separate area, but as an area that we need to tackle uh, seriously. Absolutely. And finally, I would like to ask Irina Tinagli uh, to come back to the discussion because there have been several questions connecting with the how to stabilize incomes. And one question was particularly asking whether this should be a time for an EU initiative on minimum income. And this is, of course, not purely a social policy, but very much an economic uh, policy as well. Irene, the floor is yours. 
Okay. Okay. Okay, this is a, a, a big, big issue, Nicolas, probably know something about it. Uh, I think it's important that we make process, uh, progress on uh, what we call the you know, a minimum wage in the term of trying to mm -hmm. avoid social dumping in some areas of the union, uh, trying to guarantee all the workers, you know, standards of security, standards of quality, quality of work. Uh, I'm not sure what they, the question meant uh, by uh, minimum income because there are many different interpretations. So, of course, we have also to take into account all, all the differences in the union in terms of uh, cost of life, the structure of the economy. So, it has to uh, be considered. And, uh, one thing that I, I do uh, think and I do believe is that we cannot overlook this, what I said before. We cannot overlook the importance of a uh, minimum degree of um, security, safety net, uh, 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 social welfare for the workers and for the citizens, because this is uh, very important uh, also, in the, especially in times of crisis, to have a European instruments that allow us to prevent stronger divergences, to keep the citizens in the labor market, to help them uh, being uh, qualified enough, to be paid enough, to have the rights that they should have. I mean, we have to make sure, maybe we, we I don't think it would be easier to get to a point in which the, the, the European Union grant a, a universal income to all the citizens of the Union. There are, I don't think that's the point, but I think is the point that the European Union takes care of uh, harmonizing uh, a certain uh, amount of uh, rights, of security, of making sure that uh, there is uh, social uh, uh, equality and rights in the union that allow, um, you know, prevent these divergences, as we said. And I think it is important that economic policies uh, uh, takes this into account and are aware of this. And it's not, it's not just social, uh, this is economic. Uh, this is about keeping the single market, it's about keeping the uh, economy working. Um, so I, I, I think I would like to see this awareness and trying to think which are the best instruments to allow for this on one hand, but also to prevent, um, you know, people are always afraid about moral hazard, but I, I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking really about rights, about harmonization, about safety net, about uh, services to allow people to face the crisis in the job market, in the economy, because the two things are intertwined. The sooner and the better the uh, citizens uh, get into their jobs and the, they feel safer, the better the economy will go, the more consumes and the better the market will go. So I think we have to keep these things straight in mind and think about the best uh, uh, instrument. But I, I know Nicolas is working hard on this and I'm hopeful we will get to something good soon. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, we have had a fascinating discussion at a really special time. I thank all the panelists, um, Nicola Schmidt, Anton Hemerek, Irene Tudagli, Liva Franzen uh, for the interventions and also I thank those who sent the questions. Uh, I regret that not all questions that have been sent in writing uh, have been uh, uh, discussed uh, live but there were so many and we will do our utmost to send some written answers in the chat box uh, to the extent this is possible in the coming uh, uh, minutes. Um, I also should highlight that tomorrow there is an interesting uh, Facebook event with all the progressive EU commissioners at 5 uh, p.m. I suppose Nicola will also uh, participate in this. So if you are using uh, Facebook for political activity or you are just interested, then tune on at five o'clock on uh, Labor Day. Uh, social investment is a topic which is um, very wide and I think some key aspects which also connect us with um, the policy debates of this time have been discussed today, but I can promise that FEPS will come back uh, to these issues uh, item by item also in the coming period. 
uh, because we are working on those, on both the economic and the social aspects. And you uh, can also uh, uh, follow our um, uh, publications uh, from FEBS and the Progressive Post Plus, a new series which FEBS launched about the COVID crisis, which is called the COVID Response uh, 